So very simple. It's cubic F with a multi of a calcium atom at zero 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 and fluorine atom at a quarter and three quarters. And that's what it looks like in three dimensions. We also need to think about the symmetry of lattices because uh, that determines many of the properties, crystalline properties. Now obviously we have translational symmetry because every lattice point is identical. So when we have slip deformation, when the Burgers vector of that dislocation is a lattice vector, that means it starts at a lattice point and finishes at a lattice point, then the slip doesn't change the crystal structure at all. But if the Burgers vector is not a last vector, then when slip happens, it will introduce a fault. So, for example, a Shockley partial is an A by 6, 1, 1, 2 dislocation, and that's not a lattice vector. So whenever you get a Shockley partial moving through the lattice, you get a stacking fault left behind. So, translational symmetry comes from the fact that lattice points have the same environment. Reflection is straightforward, that you have a mirror plane. So this is directly reflected into this here. So that's reflection symmetry. Uh, rotational symmetry means that if I turn here by 90 degrees, then I bring the crystal back into coincidence. So obviously a cube edge is a four-fold axis of rotation. That means if I rotate by 90 degrees, I bring the crystal back into coincidence with itself, and I can do that four times in 360 degrees. Uh, this is a combination of a rotation by 180 degrees and a translation by half a lattice parameter. So we call this a screw axis. So you rotate by 180 degrees and move upwards. And this is a combination of a mirror plane and a translation by half a lattice parameter. So this is called a glide plane. First I mirror and then I move. So all these kinds of symmetries exist inside crystals. And now we will look at groups of crystals. Because the vast majority of materials are not single crystals, but they are groups of crystals. And that means that there are boundaries between crystals. And normally when the boundary is between two identical crystals which have a misorientation, it's called a grain boundary. But if the boundary is between two different kinds of crystals, it's called an interface. And a grain boundary is a region over which the lattice orientation changes, whereas the general interface is a discontinuity between different crystal structures or crystals with different chemical compositions. Now, let's, let's describe a boundary by creating it. So imagine that we have a single crystal here. I can create a boundary by first cutting that crystal into two parts and then rotating them with respect to each other so that there is a misorientation and then joining them together. Okay. Now, in order to join them together, I need material, don't I? Because, look, I've, I've cut and I've rotated. <coughs> So I need to put material in here. And that material is the extra half plane of a dislocation. So I can describe the structure of the boundary in terms of an array of dislocations. Here you are. This is an array of dislocations. And all those extra half planes represent the material which fills up this gap. Okay. So as I put more and more dislocations inside this boundary, the misorientation theta increases. So, when I have a large misorientation, I expect the distance between the dislocations in the boundary to be smaller. And that is obvious also from this geometry, that the spacing D is related to the angle theta because the tangent of the angle theta is simply the Burgers vector of the dislocation divided by the spacing between dislocations. So we 
we now have the structure of a grain boundary being described in terms of dislocations. And dislocations are defects. So they have an energy per unit length. So if I add up the energies per unit length of all those dislocations, then I get the energy of the boundary per unit area. And just to show you that real boundaries consist of arrays of dislocations, this is a photograph which was taken by Professor Yang many, many, many years ago, okay. which I, I found in my archives. And you can see these are arrays of dislocations, which are low angle grain boundaries. So above and below this net, there is a different crystallographic orientation. And on either side of this net, there is a different crystallographic orientation. These are also boundaries. But the misorientation is large, so on this scale, we can't see the separation between the dislocations. But if you did better microscopy, you know, higher resolution microscopy, you could still find the dislocations in the boundary. So I, I explained to you that in this array of dislocations, each dislocation has an energy per unit length. And I know the spacing between dislocations. So if I work out the total amount of dislocation line energy in a unit area, then I have the grain boundary energy per unit area. Right? And this was done a long time ago by Reed. So the energy per unit area is related to the spacing between the dislocations, the Burgers vector of the dislocations. This, this consists of uh, elastic constants, and that is the core energy of the dislocation. If I make a plot of that, uh, well, first of all, oops, that's, sorry. Yeah, this is the energy per unit length of a dislocation. Yeah. So, um, here, D effectively represents the distance to which the strain field of a dislocation extends. Right? Now, if I take a dislocation, its strain field goes to infinity. Okay? So, if the energy of a dislocation is infinite, so the strain field goes to infinity. But we don't have a crystal which is infinite in size. So if the size of the crystal is D, then instead of infinity, we use D over here, and then the energy of a dislocation becomes a finite quantity per unit length. When I place one dislocation on top of another, as in an interface, the strain field approximately extends up to a distance D where D is the spacing of the dislocation. So if I place them closer and closer together, then the strain field extends to a smaller and smaller distance. Because, after all, this half plane is a region of compression. Underneath, there is a region of tension. This is compression, so it's going to compensate for that tension. So if I put them closer and closer together, the strain field becomes narrower and narrower. And that's why I've got this D over here as the spacing between dislocations in the interface. But if you look at the equation for the energy of a dislocation, this will in general be the size of a crystal. Right, so that's the energy per unit length. And if I then multiply it by the density of dislocations we have inside the interface, and that, of course, is one upon the spacing of the dislocation. As the spacing becomes smaller, I've got more dislocations per unit area. Then I get the energy of the interface as a function of the misorientation between the two crystals. This is a very, very famous equation called the Reed equation. It gives you the interface energy as a function of the misorientation theta. If I plot that out, that it looks like this, that the interface energy increases 
as the mixed orientation increases. People call this a low angle boundary and as you go towards 15 degrees, arbitrarily we call it a high angle boundary. When you do experimental measurements, you find that there are deviations from the Reed equation. At certain orientations, suddenly the energy drops sharply, and then it rises again, and then drops sharply, and it rises again. And I'm going to illustrate why that happens. So supposing I take uh, two different lattices, okay? and each lattice is an hexagonal array of points, and I put them on top of each other in exact coincidence, that means you can't see any difference between the two. And then I rotate one with respect to the other. Then at certain values of the rotation angle, you find that they have common points. So you generate a pattern in which, although many of the lattice points are in different orientations because you have rotated, some of them fit exactly. And that's called a coincidence site lattice. So that is the reason why at that value of theta, suddenly there is a decrease in interfacial energy. The diffusion coefficient increases because the amount of free volume decreases and so on. So you get special properties at certain values of theta. So even though the misorientation is large, the interface energy drops because you happen to get matching between the two crystals at particular values of theta and that these orientations are called coincidence cyclists. Now, in order to describe a grain boundary, we need five degrees of freedom. Okay. Let me explain what that means. If I needed to describe a vector here, with respect to a set of axes, then I can describe its uh, orientation by taking <coughs> the cosines of the three angles. So cos alpha, cos beta, and cos delta. So these are called the direction cosines. Uh, if I take the sum of squares of those direction cosines, that's equal to 1, which means that I only need two of these to describe the orientation of the vector. So if that vector is pointing at 90 degrees to an interface, then I only need two numbers to describe the direction of that interface, the orientation of that interface. Okay, so that's two degrees of freedom. I can describe the misorientation between two crystals by taking an axis and rotating about that axis. 
And I need two degrees of freedom to describe the direction of that axis and one the angle. So there are two vectors. One is at 90 degrees to the interface plane, which gives me two degrees of freedom. Then I have an axis and an angle of rotation to generate the bicrystal. So in total, there are five parameters needed to describe the crystallography of an interface. And that's uh, illustrated here. So first of all, I need an axis and an angle to describe the misorientation between these two crystals. But even if I keep the misorientation constant, I can alter the plane of the interface. So here it's, it's along, along this orientation, I can alter the plane of the interface without altering the misorientation. That means that I have these two extra degrees of freedom to describe the orientation of the so there are five parameters in all to describe the crystallography of an interface. Two to specify the unit vector normal to the interface. Two to specify the axis of rotation. And one, the angle of rotation. Now, just to finish off with, we are interested in whether an interface is coherent or incoherent. And of course, if you make a crystal small enough, you can have forced coherency. That means coherency with distortions of planes. But what about stress-free coherency? That means that the coherent interface is maintained no matter how big our crystal is. Let's find a theoretical condition which tells us whether or not we can get a coherent interface between any two crystals in any orientation. So this is a completely general condition that we are going to find. So if somebody told you, I've got an yttrium barium oxide crystal and nickel, is it possible to get a coherent interface between these two? That you should be able to say yes or no. So the necessary condition for obtaining a coherent interface. Now yesterday, we looked at the transformation from austenite to ferrite. And we realize that we can get that transformation with the Bain strain, where we compress along one axis and expand along the other two axes. Yeah. So this is the body-centered tetragonal unit cell of austenite. If I compress it along here and expand along here and here, then I can get the body-centered cubic cell of ferrite. So the strains involved, one of them is negative, it's compression along the z-axis. And then the other two strains are positive. Yeah, we are expanding along this axis and this axis. And I can write that down in a matrix. This is the Bain strain. The two strains along the x and y axis are expansions, they are positive. You can see that here, this is larger than this and therefore epsilon node is positive. This is a compression and is negative. This value, the left parameter of ferrite, is smaller than that of phosphine. So, the principal deformations, one of them is positive, and two of, them, two of them are positive, and one is negative. And we imagine this deformation by saying, let's, let's take the austenite as a sphere. When I apply the Bain strain, it will be compressed along this direction, and expanded along this direction, so I have an ellipsoid. I can find two vectors, AO and OB, which remain unchanged in direction, uh, unchanged in magnitude, but are altered in direction. So those are not coherent lines. They are rotated. But if I rotate this ellipsoid by this angle here, I can bring one of them into coincidence. So it is possible to find an orientation relationship between austenite and ferrite, which will give me one line which is perfectly coherent. But it is impossible to find two lines, two non-parallel lines, which are perfectly coherent. Here, these two lines become exactly unrotated and undistorted. But this one goes to a larger misorientation. So we concluded yesterday that it is impossible 
in order to find a coherent interface, I need to find another line which is unrotated and undistorted. And that is not possible if two of the principal deformations are positive and one is negative. However, if one of the principal deformations becomes zero, that means, for example, the vector at 90 degrees to this is not altered by the Bain strain, then, of course, I have that vector and this vector, and I can find a perfectly coherent interface. That's impossible for austenite and ferrite. But if you could do that, if you could find such a deformation, then we would be able to get a coherent interface. And a coherent in interface, of course, is an invariant plane. It has nothing changed in a plane. If I can find two non-parallel vectors, which are unrotated and undistorted, they define a plane which is unrotated and undistorted. And we saw that invariant planes are like this. It can either be an expansion normal to that plane. So in this case, the principal, one of the principal deformations is positive, and the other two are zero. It can be a simple shear like this or it can be an invariant plane strain. Now, it turns out that in going from austenite to epsilon iron, which is hexagonal iron, we have exactly the situation that we want. That means that one of the deformations is zero, the other one is positive, and the third one is negative. Yeah, you have compression along here, expansion along here, and one of them is zero. So this is an invariant line. If I rotate about this axis, then one of them becomes coincident, so I get two invariant lines. So it is possible to find a fully coherent interface between austenite and hexagonal line. Of course, that is also obvious if you look at the crystal structure, that this is the crystal structure of austenite, where the closed back layers, the 111 planes, are stacked in ABC, ABC sequence. Hexagonal iron, the only difference is that the stacking sequence is AB, AB. So if I shift every second layer, I can go from austenite to hexagonal so that that is maintaining perfect coherence. So the general condition for a fully coherent interface between any two crystals is that if you can find an information which changes one crystal into another and which has principal strain which is positive, zero and negative, then you can find a coherent interface. If you cannot find that, it's impossible to get a stress-free coherent interface. So this applies to any two set of crystals. <coughs> you must be able to deform one crystal into another with a strain which leaves one direction uh, two directions completely unchanged in length. That means the principal strains must be positive, zero, and negative. You can apply that to any two crystal structures to see if a coherent interface is possible. Of course, it has many, many applications. You know, when you are depositing layers epitaxial, you really want them to be coherent with the substrate. Yeah. So you could do a calculation to see whether you need to cut your substrate on particular planes in order to get matching with the material you are depositing. And it applies to nucleation theory as well, because if you can get an orientation where you can get good, where you can get this coherency, then nucleation becomes easy, and so on. So you find that the orientation relationship that you get between a precipitate and its matrix is the orientation which gives you an invariant line or an invariant plane. So by doing this, you can predict the orientation relationship. So, you know, the reason why we get, you know, Kerjum of Sachs type orientation is simply because it gives us that invariant line. And similarly, between hexagonal and face centered cubic, the orientation is because we get the coherent plane. And this applies to any crystal system. 
it will try to maximize coherency during nucleation because that reduces the interface energy. So what we've done today is we've gone through elementary crystallography and we've reached a really advanced conclusion that you should be able to calculate for any two crystals, doesn't matter what symmetry, whether or not a coherent interface is possible. There of course is a lot more theory we can do, but the essence of everything is in that principle that we have discovered, how to get a coherent interface.